Well, welcome everybody to Briefing with Confidence before tomorrow's flight. The whole idea here is to try to stack the deck in your favor. And my name is Scott Denstead. Some of you may know me. And I'm a CFI and former National Weather Service meteorologist. Been doing this for 25 years or so as a CFI and almost 40 years, actually over 40 years as a meteorologist. And I'm also EA's subject matter expert on weather. So if you're an EA member, go ahead and log in. There's a, a number of webinars that I've done over the last uh, two or three years. And they're all available on uh, recording uh, for EA members. I'm also the founder of the newest aviation progressive web app, and that is Easy Weather Brief, and that's at easywxbrief.com. And I'll tell you more about that as we go along at the end. And I'm also the co-author of Pilot Weather from Solo to the Airlines, it's written by myself and Captain Doug Morris, who is a Boeing 787 for uh, Air Canada. And you can get his, or you can get our book at pilotweatherbook.com if you're interested. All right, so when we're thinking about any type of flying and, and specifically weather-related flying, we have to really kind of look at and, and understand the details of what the threats are. And if you're somebody who, like me, who spends a lot of time with their nose in accident reports and NTSB reports, looking at various different studies, you'll notice that weather is listed as the primary cause of 35% of general aviation accidents. Now, that includes really simple accidents like a hard landing, um, maybe a prop strike, but in general, weather is listed as the primary cause of 35% of general aviation accidents. The important statistics, although, are considering all general aviation accidents, not just those related to weather, 6% are what we call VFR into IMC. That's visual flight rules into instrument meteorological conditions. Now, the one that really drives it home is the fact that that 6% are responsible for a quarter of all fatal general aviation accidents. That's, a, that's an amazing amount of, of deaths with a small number of accidents. And that's because VFR in the IMC is very much a fatal aspect of, of flying. So if you fly VFR in the IMC, get yourself into trouble, most likely you're going to die in that accident. And the question I always ask myself is, are these just a lot of low-time pilots getting themselves into trouble? And the answer is yes. But in the mix of that, Mother Nature doesn't really care about the number of hours in your logbook. So there are some high-time pilots, instrument-rated pilots, you know, even professional pilots that fall into this trap from time to time. And certainly the, um, the Kobe Bryant helicopter accident in Southern California is a good example of that situation. Now, if you've never read the Null Report, uh, it's probably something that you should put on your list of things to do this year. Uh, it comes out once a year, and they go through all the various different aspects of aviation accidents in a lot of different categories. But I pulled this one out of 2015, although you could find just about any year a uh, very similar look and feel to it. And what you'll notice is that uh, listed at the bottom are the various different reasons why you would uh, fall into it, a weather-related accident, including turbulence, poor IFR technique, airframe icing, thunderstorms, and VFR and IMC. Now, I've removed essentially all the accidents that are not relate, or I've kept all the accidents that are, or that are not related to wind. So wind-related accidents aren't in, included in this, and they count for uh, over 50% of the uh, weather-related accidents. But you can notice that every one of these causes certainly uh, drives home accidents and also fatal accidents. But when you look at VFR and IMC in this particular year, 
there were uh, 21 accidents that were labeled VFR and IMC, and out of that, uh, 20 fatalities. So this is a serious problem that we want to avoid, and the best way to do that is to do a good pre-flight briefing. All right, so let's take a look at tomorrow's weather. So I'm hoping this sounds familiar to most of you. You're hoping to make a long cross-country flight tomorrow morning. I can guarantee you that this has gone through my head many, many times. And over the last few days, you've been scratching your head trying to find out whether or not you're going to be able to make that trip. And so this is a constant thing that we, we do uh, on pretty much all of our flights. I may look out three or four or five days in advance and to try to figure out whether I'm going to make the flight on the day that I really want to, where my schedule permits. And so this is a common thing to be looking at. And this is what we're going to focus on uh, tonight. So it's really important to take the time to thoroughly look at the weather the night prior. When I do my pre-flight planning for myself, when I'm making a flight, I spend most of my time the night before about this time of the evening to try to kind of figure out if I'm going to be able to make that flight tomorrow morning. And yes, I'm not going to make the decision necessarily tonight, but nevertheless, I'm really trying to get as much information as I can. So when I wake up in the morning, I'm just doing some small little tweaks here and there, making sure that it's all looking like it was the previous uh, evening. So, you definitely don't want to be rushing that briefing as you're trying to close the door in the cockpit and depart. And if you have most of your good information, that, that kind of big picture weather in your head, getting up the next morning, again, it's just doing a little bit of fine tuning. It makes it a lot easier and also helps you avoid missing anything important. And so what weather guidance is really valuable to examine if you're going to depart sometime tomorrow morning, what gives you the biggest bang for your buck? Well, when you start looking at time as the issue is that it's really difficult to forecast certain adverse weather, such as icing, turbulence, and convection with any certainty when you're looking out at you know, more than 12 to 18 hours in advance. It's just really difficult to do that in terms of the, the science behind it. So there's a lot of uncertainty with the that 12 to 18 to 24, 36 hours and beyond. However, you can get a pretty good idea of what's going to happen, where the problem areas are going to be um, located along your route, or maybe essentially all about timing. So we may feel for, for whatever reason that we can make this flight. But remember, when we're looking out at, at 12, 18 hours and beyond, we may be dealing with an error that's uh, plus or minus 12 hours or six hours. So that means that if the front is expected to, let's say, pass through, it may actually pass through six hours earlier or six hours later than what was forecast. So there's a lot of still a lot of uncertainty in this, in this uh, time frame. And so the first point, if anybody's ever done uh, any of my webinars, you're going to notice that uh, you've probably seen this before, and that is details are really important, but the big picture weather is what rules. And so you see this accident that occurred here, this pickup truck that evidently must have flipped over the guardrail and ended up uh, sitting there on the ledge. And there's a lot of details you can certainly pick out and try to figure out what happened but if you're looking at the big picture, this really tells you that whoever was in that, that, that truck uh, escaped a, uh, probably a, a, certainly a, a, a situation where you perish to your, your, uh, your death. But this is why it's, it's important to look at the big picture weather and not get over-focused on some of the details. One of the things I recommend to all of my students is that they avoid using rules of thumb. Rules of thumb tend to replace real analysis. You need a thorough analysis prior to your flight to really make 
good decisions while you're in flight. So understanding the big weather picture is one of those things that you need to do. And certainly if you don't do a really good job, you do a cursory view, that's often going to lead to some really poor decisions in flight. So again, try to avoid those rules of thumb if at all possible. Analyze the data so that you can make those good decisions. And again, even though we're talking about looking at the weather uh, 18, 24 hours in advance, your weather analysis should never stop when you close the door on the cockpit and depart. In fact, it may get really interesting at that point in time when things are changing, maybe they weren't forecast. So again, don't drop the ball, continue your weather analysis even into the flight. So I often get the question when I'm at Oshkosh or Sun and Fun or doing a, a presentation somewhere, Scott, you must have the best approach to doing a pre-flight briefing because you're a meteorologist, you're a, you're a CFI, you're a commercial pilot, you must have it down pat. And the answer is I really don't. I use what's called the funnel approach. And that is I tend to focus mostly on the big picture. Then I kind of work my way to down to those details. And the night before, there are not a lot of details to really look at. So that's one of the other reasons I love to spend most of my time the night before is that it, it really forces me to stick with the big picture. And those details are important and you need to learn about them the next day when you're about to fly, but hopefully they'll match pretty well with the big picture that you saw the night before. So once again, when we look at forecasts and we're in the, the longer range forecasts, we call those medium to long range forecasts here, essentially you're more than 60 hours out, there's a lot of uncertainty. And as you get closer and closer to the, your departure time, you get down to your now cast, less than about six hours, you're gonna fill in a lot of those important details. And what is the ceiling at your departure airport? Are there any pilot reports along your route showing any kind of severe weather? But in this particular webinar, we're gonna focus on that 12 to 24 hour time frame. And so that's what we call short range forecast right in here. So there's certainly a lot more certainty than the long range forecast, but not as certain with respect to this now cast. So what is not available to us 12, 18, 24 hours prior? Well, most of it is observational data. Things such as surface observations or METARs your radar depictions, radar mosaics, satellite images, pilot weather reports, all those are observational based data and they're not available to us 12, 24 hours before the flight. Certainly we can look at those and we can start to look at trends in the weather, There's nothing wrong with that, but they're not gonna be as uh, appropriate to look at when you're looking at the weather uh, the night before. We also won't have other advisories such as the graphical air mets, SIGMETs, center weather advisories. None of those are available to us because they don't go out far enough in the future. And we can look at what kind of things are happening. So maybe if there's SIGMETs that are, you know, uh, that been issued one after another in a particular area, it's very possible that may continue over the next 12, 18 hours or so. But we don't have that information available to us the night before. So what kind of things are available to us 12, 18, 24 hours out? Well, prog charts, various different precipitation forecasts, convective outlooks, Terminal forecasts, forecast discussions, if you read any of those, those are available as well. And a various different automated forecasts. This is usually forecasts that come from numerical weather prediction models. Those are all available to us. And for the most part, 
all of this guidance is big picture weather. Yes, the terminal forecast, they go out 24 to 30 hours. And they're probably more related to more details, what's happening at a particular airport. Um, but most of the, the data you're looking at, most of the charts, most of the forecasts are all going to be based on that big picture guide. So that's good. That's, that really focuses you 100% on that big weather picture, which is really critical to making good decisions. All right, so I'm going to do something tonight that I generally don't like to do, and that is we're going to actually do a real cross-country plan using real weather, not, uh, not archive weather, but real weather, for a flight that we're going to hopefully depart tomorrow from Mobile, Alabama to Richmond, Virginia. The hope is that we're going to depart around 8 o'clock in the morning, and it's about 8 o'clock tonight. So this is a really good kind of situation where I spend, again, if I'm going to be making a flight tomorrow morning, I'm probably going to be sitting down at about 8 o'clock and starting to look at all the, the details at the big picture level. And we'll assume that we're flying in a piston aircraft at, you know, at or below 15,000 feet. And we'll, I know there's a, a number of folks out there that are only VFR only, but we'll also, you know, possibly consider IFR if that becomes necessary given the situation. So here's our flight from Mobile, Alabama, all the way up to Richmond, Virginia. Now, an aircraft that you fly, uh, 680 nautical miles may be too long. You may have to have a fuel stop somewhere in between. But for now, we'll, we'll, we won't worry about the, uh, the fuel stop at this point. Again, we're trying to get an understanding of the big weather picture for the weather along that particular route. So, and the other aspect of doing these kind of things in kind of a live scenario is unfortunately, uh, sometimes the weather doesn't cooperate and we don't get any really interesting weather. But if you've been watching uh, the news recently, uh, obviously there's a major weather system that's about to take shape uh, for, for tomorrow. So, so we have that, uh, that for us. So this, in this particular case, we're gonna travel from Mobile, Alabama, all the way up to Richmond, Virginia trying to leave around eight o'clock in the morning. And so we're gonna use my new application, Easy Weather Brief. Uh, that's a new progressive web app. Um, but the imagery you'll see here is not something that I created myself. This is all available in various different government websites like the Aviation Weather Center, Storm Prediction Center, Weather Prediction Center, the National Center uh, for Environmental Prediction, um, and some of the various different heavyweight apps out there provide this information. I collect it all and, and put it into a, a nice wrapper um, that you can, can walk through, and you'll see how that's being used uh, today. So, again, this is going to be using real weather. Uh, so I'm, I took, took a quick look at it uh, a little bit earlier today. So we'll walk through it and see what kind of changes has, has occurred. All right, so we'll go ahead and head on over to Easy Weather Brief. All right, here's the Easy Weather Brief Progressive Web App, and I've got the route plotted here directly here, and just to see what that looks like here, that's uh, Mobile going through Greensboro and up through Richmond. Now, we can decide, uh, and I put in 11,000 feet as a placeholder here, and we can decide that that may not be the, the best route, in this case, kind of a direct route, and we're going to part here at 8 a.m. Uh, the time here is showing at 8 a.m., and again, that may be not the best time to depart. Maybe it's better to depart a little earlier, a little later. But ultimately, this is what we're going to kind of look at for this particular webinar. As you can see right away, uh, there's lots of wind symbols here. So it's going to be windy probably near the surface uh, at 8 o'clock in the morning tomorrow. And certainly some IFR showing as red and, and even some marginal VFR conditions uh, uh, to the um, south and east of the routes. And then VFR kind of up the, the coastline here. And we walk that through. And for the most part, that generally stays kind of the same. Not much is happening uh, in terms of the overall weather depiction. Although, again, some of these wind symbols are showing up here 
uh, showing the, uh, the fact that you got 16 knots gusting to 25. So this is definitely going to be a windy kind of, of situation and maybe associate it with some pretty significant turbulence. And most of the significant weather in terms of any kind of thunderstorms are occurring much further to the, uh, to the west. You can see the thunderstorm symbols showing up here and even some mixed precipitation and snow all along the back side of this. But the initial wind event is pr probably some of the most significant things that we can see uh, looking here. And then you can you know, further zoom in here and even look at, um, let's go ahead and change this to a, um, a different map display here. I like to use the dark version. It's a lot of good contrast. And then you can uh, certainly pull up other aspects of this and say, okay, what are those ceilings or marginal VFR along the route? So we're going to look at the forecast ceilings. In this particular case, there's the ceiling height and kind of get an assessment for what's happening along the route at that particular time. And sure enough, all these numbers here are showing ceilings that are in the IFR category. And so this is not going to be an easy VFR trip, at least not looking at it from this perspective here. Uh, even our departure time, let me go back to the departure time of 8 a.m. Uh, we have marginal VFR and lots of marginal VFR in the blue coloring uh, with some IFR and even low IFR and magenta along the route. So this definitely shows us that that, that direct route that we're looking at is probably not going to work too well simply because of the fact that you have uh, those, uh, those marginal VFR, IFR, and even low IFR, IFR conditions for a VFR flight that's probably not going to work. Uh, you could possibly get on top of the weather, um, but again, that's uh, a lot more risky. This is probably likely to be an IFR flight. And if you're somebody that doesn't like to fly over the mountains where there's you know, potential instrument uh, conditions near the surface, maybe a route that's, that heads a little bit more to the east and then finally up to the north would be potentially more appropriate. And even showing here where you see the kind of the darker areas where there's no ceiling markers showing, that gives you a good indication that there isn't a ceiling. So it could be scattered or, or few clouds or even clear skies in that area. All right, before we get uh, too deep into all this, let's take a look again at the big picture weather. And I'll go to my... Uh, static imagery page where we'll be able to see all the various different images associated with it. And I like to start with the surface analysis to kind of get a understanding of the big weather picture from that standpoint. Now this is what's happened in the recent past and what you're trying to look for is you know kind of where the major weather players are. And we see up here, I'll take this back a little bit in time. So this takes us back about 24 hours. And what you can see is we have a pretty large area high pressure over the northeastern U.S., and you can watch what happens to that high. And this is a pretty pretty intense high for this time of year. We're talking about, you know, 1043 central pressure there. Uh, that's pretty significant. And you see how that kind of just eventually starts to move and drift off a little bit farther to the east and finally kind of off the picture. So we know that the weather is moving from west to east, and that, that high pressure is not kind of, you know, digging its, uh, its claws into the ground. You know, not moving at all. So essentially that's going to allow uh, some of the weather that's further west to make its way uh, further east. And so we also see here uh, kind of a, at the surface, you can see the wind barbs on this, which show a southerly flow. And we know a southerly flow off the, um, the Atlantic or off the Gulf Coast near the surface produces a lot of moisture and adds to instability. And you can even see in here, we've got some Temperatures up there in the 75, um, maybe even a, a higher temperature here and there, but dew points are not, you know, are way up there. We got some 60s and some 50s, so the dew points are not way up there. So there's probably not a lot of, a lot of instability. But nevertheless, as this weather system is expected to move out of the Rockies, um, that's going to kind of tap into all that Gulf moisture and Atlantic moisture and develop into some pretty serious weather. And the best way to kind of see that is looking at the prog charts. I look at the prog charts that are produced by the Weather Prediction Center. Now, these, uh, these particular prog charts, there's a lot to unpack with these uh, charts themselves, but I'll just give you a quick overview. Uh, when you look at these uh, charts, there's a number of things on them, and one is the isobars or in high pressure and low pressure centers. 
that's those in the frontal systems that you see. Those are all issued by the forecasters at the Weather Prediction Center, the WPC. Then you also have the, in, in this particular case, you're showing all the uh, precipitation type that's reaching the surface. And you can see the legend out here on the left. Now, a lot of uh, pilots I've, I've heard say, well, you know, there's, there's going to be heavy rain where you see the dark green. It doesn't really describe the intensity. It just describes the likelihood or, or probability. So anywhere you see the darker colors, whether it's dark blue, dark green, dark purple, that's a higher probability that precipitation will reach the surface. And the numbers or probability numbers are 55% or greater. And anything in the lighter colors, the lighter green, the lighter blue, that shows you you're dealing with a, uh, as low as a 15% all the way up to 55%. So in some of the uh, uh, lighter green colors, like you see here over the Western North Carolina, that may be as low as a 15 or 20% chance in that area. And so we watched kind of the, the progression of this. And so this is valid at 6Z in the overnight hours and finally by 12Z. And then let's watch what happens to this area of low pressure moves through over the uh, Mississippi at this point. And then by the time you get to uh, tomorrow at the same, or I should say um, Friday at the same time, that low is already up here in moving into New Brunswick and Canada. So it's at, along a pretty good clip at this point. So it's literally in the eastern part of Oklahoma, and then finally zips along and 24 hours later is all the way up in Canada. So it's moving at a pretty good uh, clip here. And so it, as a result of that, uh, the weather is moving pretty good. That generally tells me that you've got a lot of wind energy in the atmosphere. And that wind energy is part of that is going to potentially uh, transfer the momentum of that wind down to the surface. So we're possibly dealing with some pretty strong gusty winds uh, most of tomorrow. Nevertheless, let's take a, a closer look at this. So tomorrow morning, 12 Z on Thursday, that's uh, 7 a.m. Eastern time. There's our area of low pressure right there in the eastern part of Oklahoma. And you notice from our route here from Mobile, Alabama and southern Alabama, kind of up the uh, ap spine of the Appalachians here, or maybe just a little bit to the east, what we see is a little bit of a possibility of precipitation. Likely that's caused by some upslope. Remember that wind off the um, Atlantic here. We have a situation where we're at sea level in Charleston, South Carolina. As we go up towards the foothills um, into the Appalachians itself, you get a rising terrain and that helps a little bit of upslope as well. And that's probably also causing a fair amount of, of uh, the, those IFR and even low IFR conditions that we were seeing on the map. You also have a pretty large range of these, this red hatched area that's around it is convective precipitation. And we're talking about not necessarily thunderstorms, but a convectively driven uh, kind of, uh, of situation here. Uh, now, again, if you look at this at our departure airport, there is a low probability that you could be seeing precipitation out of our departure airport. Um, and that may still allow us to, to get out early enough if we don't delay and we can either decide to go our normal or our, our preferred route, which would be a direct route, or possibly change the route to a more eastern uh, kind of a, a situation. And if you again look at this, this is now uh, valid here um, in this particular case at 18Z or 1 p.m. Um, Eastern time. And by that time, now we have that, in this case, there looked like there'd be possibility of even severe uh, storms there. And certainly by that particular uh, time in the afternoon, a lot of that more significant weather is moving in. So we definitely don't want to delay getting out of Mobile, Alabama, as we head out. But the nice thing I see here is that entire coastal plains area uh, from Georgia, South Carolina, North Carolina, even into Virginia, uh, stays pretty clean in, in terms of any significant precip. One of the other things I, I like to do is also look at, because this doesn't tell you anything about intensity, what I like to look at is the uh, QPF, which is the quantity of precip, quantity. QPF stands for qu quantitative precipitation forecast. This is also developed by the folks out at uh, the Weather Prediction Center. And what we see here uh, is not, not necessarily a probability, although when you look at this particular forecast, 
they generally don't put any kind of precipitation on this chart unless there's at least a 50% or greater chance of occurring. So it tends to filter out a lot of the low probability events. And if we watch this uh, happen over the next uh, six to, to 12 hours, what we see here is some really intense precipitation. And this is inches of, uh, of precipitation. And if it were snow, they would melt that down to a liquid equivalent we're talking about, in some cases, maybe even one to maybe even one and a half inches in a six-hour window. It's a six-hour QPF, and that's pretty significant there. And again, we a little bit of precipitation happening right here over the, the southern Appalachians, so and maybe that direct route is not probably the best, you know, getting out of Mobile, heading maybe down to towards the, um, the southern part of Georgia, and then heading up the coast would be a little bit better from that standpoint. Um, and if we watch that weather kind of move in, so certainly by the, the evening hours, uh, that route is, is, is still, you know, a, fair, a fairly good opening. But down the south here, that's probably when we're going to expect the most significant weather to occur. And then finally, moving in along the entire coast. So, again, that weather is clipping along at a pretty good rate. The next thing I generally look at here is... I look at the upper level charts. And no, this is not a chart that you're usually taught. I think it's valuable to learn. I do spend a lot of time with my students teaching them how to use this. Uh, this really tells you where the true energy is in the atmosphere and, and kind of whether or not there's any upper level support. And as we can see, as we walk through this, um, don't worry about the timing of this. Just look at the kind of the progression of the weather aloft here. What we can see is there is a, an area, a disturbance, an upper level disturbance, we call this an upper level short wave trough in this area. And that's kind of supporting that area of low pressure that we saw in the uh, eastern part of, of Oklahoma. And that's where the most significant weather is generally starting to occur. But watch what happens to that trough. It generally kind of flattens out and just gets absorbed by the main flow. And so that means that essentially over the next 24 to 36 hours, uh, that weather system is kind of in a dissipating state. Doesn't mean that it's not dangerous, but ultimately that's kind of what's happening. It's losing its upper level features. And that's why it's kind of clipping along as it gets into that strong flow uh, from Southwest to Northeast. It kind of clips along pretty, uh, um, pretty effectively. And eventually that entire trough kind of eventually makes its way off the coast. So it's going to, over the next period of, of uh, 12 to 24 hours, you're going to see that, uh, that upper level we weather system kind of move in and essentially lose support. And that's why this weather system eventually dissipates as it gets closer to the coastline. But nevertheless, uh, all day on tomorrow, essentially, if we look starting out at kind of um, the early morning hours, uh, we see that most of the significant weather is off to the east, I'm sorry, off to the west, and moving east with time. And by the time we get to the afternoon and early evening, then we start to see more of that kind of dropping further south and, and east with time and that as well. The other aspect of this too is I like to also look at the 700 millibar chart, which is around 10,000 feet. Now that's a, that's a good altitude. That's about the altitude we're planning to fly in this case. And so that's another element to this that I'd like to, to focus on. And it has a, um, a feature, a specific element or, or um, forecast item here that most pilots, again, don't get introduced to, but I think it's really important. And that is this, uh, this red and blue uh, area here that you see. Uh, that's what's called omega, which is uh, the, the red area is, is upward motion through 10,000 feet, not like an updraft but essentially upward motion, we know that air is moving upward, it's, it's expanding and, and cooling, and condensing out, um, and the blue areas are subsiding air. And so where you don't see the, the blue or red, you know essentially we don't have a lot of upward and downward motion of the air, and generally speaking, uh, that's, uh, that's still pretty good flying weather. And you notice that when you see these concentric circles, that's really pretty significant upward motion in the atmosphere. As we get towards, uh, essentially towards the end of the, uh, the day tomorrow, um, essentially that all that weather moves and becomes more problematic. So in the time frame that we're looking to depart, this looks pretty clean, not any kind of major disturbances, a good tailwind here, 
we have 30 knots, 35, maybe up to 40 knots in some areas along that, along that route. So a good tailwind, but nevertheless, most of the, the, the significant weather is not moving in until much later. And that gives me a lot of confidence. And I'm not dealing with any, any significant weather from this standpoint. The other thing is that shows here is this relative humidity, this green area. So again, if you're looking at that the eastern kind of route here, um, and this is valid uh, at uh, 10 o'clock in the morning, we're going to be well on our way um, at 10,000 feet. We should be in pretty clean air, not much in the way of significant moisture at that altitude. But now if we go a little bit lower and look at essentially what's happening at 500 or um, 850 millibars, which is roughly 5,000 feet, then we can see that we have a lot more moisture there in the morning. So this is early morning hours. And so that you know, somewhere around the 5,000 foot area, we'd expect to see with some of this uh, moisture, see some clouds in association with that. And, and, and that certainly stays there for the most part, most throughout the day. So, and, and gets a, a lot more uh, significant as the, uh, as the day wears on. So higher up is probably going to be better in this case, lower down, we're probably going to be in some uh, IFR conditions around 5,000 feet. Now, what about the possibility of, of icing potential? I know a lot of folks are probably asking that question as well. And so icing-wise, uh, certainly the freezing level is a, is a good start here to determine what's happening from, a, uh, from an icing perspective. And this is the lowest freezing level forecast. And if we go over until we see, let's say, 7 o'clock tomorrow, what we're going to notice here is that the uh, departure area down here in uh, near Mobile is the freezing levels are up between 11 and 13,000. Not too bad at all. And then finally, when we get more closer to our destination, then we're starting to see freezing levels drop between uh, down to nine to 11,000 and even around Richmond, Virginia, maybe as low as seven to nine. But you know, if we decide to go along the coastline, uh, we may have no problems, even if there were clouds and even some precipitation in that region, this is a, a, a kind of a good indication that we could stay low enough that under IFR, we would not run into any uh, significant moisture that would be below freezing. So that's a good indication there. And we could also uh, verify using the icing forecasts. And specifically, I like to use the icing severity forecast that you can see. And if we use the 15-hour forecast, which again takes us into our early morning, let's say 9 o'clock, uh, this, and we move this over, we can see it, it uh, changing by the, um, the altitude here. So we are around 10,000 feet in this particular case. And again, looking at that entire route, really nothing in the way of icing potential at 10,000 or 11,000 or 12,000 feet. It's not really until we get much, uh, even, even uh, higher, it doesn't, uh, we don't see any uh, icing because we know at 10,000 feet, it's pretty dry using the other forecast models. So this, again, it gives us a good indication that uh, if we had to go lower, um, for whatever reason, uh, we could certainly do that uh, as we get closer to our destination to avoid uh, staying higher and, and picking up any ice uh, close to our destination. Another uh, forecast I like to use for the convective element, we've talked about icing. Uh, we'll look at, uh, we'll do a quick uh, survey of the um, ceiling and visibility and such, but I in this kind of situation in, in the middle of February, usually you don't expect thunderstorms, but in this particular case, convection is a real danger. So let's look at the, the day two convective outlook. Day one is today and day two is, is tomorrow. So we're looking at the day two convective outlook, and this might look really bad because this is a marginal risk of severe weather, a slight risk and enhanced risk. And so we're talking about in this particular situation, we're talking about really those high, strong, uh, you know, uh, uh, gusty winds that are potentially occurring near the surface. This would look like a no-go, but this is starting at 12Z tomorrow morning, so that's at 7 a.m. all the way through 7 a.m. the next day, so 7 a.m. on Friday. So that's not really necessarily going to be representative of the time. The only, the only thing is, is that the white areas give you a good indication that you're probably not going to be in any significant um, uh, convection if you're in the white areas, but our trip, unfortunately, is in this marginal risk area uh, throughout the, uh, throughout the uh, route itself. But it would be better to then kind of drill down and use a, a higher uh, temporal resolution product. I use the 
three hour thunderstorm probability forecast from the short range ensemble forecast. And this allows me to look at a three hour uh, period here. So if we kind of roll this over until 10 a.m. tomorrow, uh, it's the seven to 10 a.m. period, uh, we can see that still, again, most of the convection, the thunderstorms are going to be farther out to the uh, to the west. It's not until we get maybe a little bit later on. This is in the afternoon hours. Now we see some of that uh, the probabilities going up pretty high and kind of, you know, getting really close to our uh, departure airport here in Mobile. So in that case, we definitely don't want to be uh, running too late. We want to get out as early as possible. Um, but that all falls apart as that weather system kind of tears apart from the upper level weather system that we saw. So there is a, 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 a certainly a threat that if we're running a little bit late, that that weather system is going to move in and produce some pretty serious uh, areas of convection uh, into the southern uh, Alabama region and to the panhandle of Florida. Uh, one other uh, product I like to look at is all the various different um, uh, simulate reflectivity forecast. And specifically, the one I, I, I kind of gravitate to is this um, WRF ARW model. Don't worry about that uh, in terms of the model, but this is uh, on the Storm Prediction Center's website. But if you look at this, this also gives you kind of what the next rad image might look like. And you know, for me, I love looking at next rad images. I can do a really good job of understanding based on what I see on a, on a regular next rad image, this is a forecast, a simulated reflectivity or forecast radar depiction of what it will be like uh, in the future. And it is pretty darn accurate here. And so what we see in this particular case is certainly the, the higher reflectivities that we see back here where you have the most serious weather. But you do see that area of weather that we saw in the, in the western part of uh, North Carolina into Georgia and South Carolina. And this is kind of like a speckled look uh, for the most part, you know, that's probably driven a lot by some of the, that moisture that's riding from the south and, and riding up some of these mountains here, uh, producing really more, not really as much in the way of precipitation, although you could have some uh, sprinkles in that area, but I would not necessarily think about it as being, you know, significant amount of precip. Um, but the, the, you can see here, these are kind of called cloud streets. These are really probably not really precipitation, but the model is trying to tell you there's a lot of moisture kind of being pulled in from the south. The winds are likely from, in this particular case, likely from the south to the north. And that's drawing in a lot of that, uh, that unstable moist air. And as you can see, that kind of moves forward and develops into this kind of thin line. But by that time, this is 2100. Uh, this is well into the, um, the evening hours. And so once again, if you look at it from the standpoint of our departing sometime around 7, 8, or 9 o'clock in the morning, uh, for the most part, it, again, it looks a little bit better for us to, to take that more southerly route or more easterly route first and then head to the north from that standpoint. Um, another product I, I like to, to look at, too, is uh, this HREF model uh, from a convective standpoint. In this particular model itself, is uh, has a has a great tool, especially again on in a, a time frame where we're dealing with convection. Um, this will look a lot like, um, in terms of how it's uh, looking feel, it would look a lot like a um, uh, a chart that shows you a next right image, and it's really not meant to be that uh, in terms of a simulated forecast or simulated reflectivity kind of situation. What this is on the left here, in terms of its uh, it's overall, uh, the, the, the legend is probability. It's a probability forecast. And this basically says, what is the probability that the ecotops, the top of the precipitation core, will be above 30,000 feet? And we know when that precipitation core gets really high in the, in the atmosphere, as a result of that, um, you're probably dealing with some deep convection and therefore some thunderstorms. And we can see in this particular case, none of that occurs occurring at all um, at the time frame we're looking to depart early in the morning. So most of that, again, is farther out to the, the, the west and shouldn't impact us in this particular case. And it all falls apart eventually, as you see, as that upper level weather system kind of tears away from the surface-based system. And last but not least, we'll look at the, the possibility by looking at the, um, 
Uh, let's go up to here and look at the gridit lamp forecasts. And specifically, let's take a look at the ceiling forecasts and the visibility forecast, and then we'll answer some questions. So this is the from the gridit localized aviation MOS program. This is the MOS product. This gives you a good indication of, in this case, we're looking at ceiling, of what the ceiling heights are going to be uh, like. So certainly, again, if, if you're looking at this, uh, look at the top here, you'll see that anywhere you see the, uh, the purplish colors, we're dealing with ceilings that are below 500 feet. The reddish is, uh, areas are IFR conditions. Then you get yellow and blue for the marginal VFR. And if you're looking at the, the, uh, the possibility of even some, uh, some possibilities, some VFR conditions, departing here out at, let's say, 7 o'clock in the morning, uh, certainly in the southern Alabama area, this looks to be VFR, but as you are headed up towards the, the Carolina mountains here, um, that's low IFR conditions there. So you probably don't want to find yourself uh, putting yourself in harm's way, even if you're IFR, uh, because if something happens, this is a pretty major area of low IFR conditions, whereas you have an option of going along the coastal region, staying in regions where uh, you see this kind of a what, what color like a light tan color, that, that area shows you ceilings that are at or above um, 12,000 feet, so basically clear below 12,000, which is perfect for us when we're looking at uh, making a a flight that keeps us out of adverse weather. And for the most part, that stays that way throughout the entire uh, day. And the only other thing you would want to look at, too, is the ceiling forecast as well, same from the same model here. And in this case, the visibility forecast, I should say, is that shows, for the most part, not any really major visibility issues except right here in the Carolina Mountains. And, um, and that even, for the most part, the entire route uh, stays in visibility that's uh, certainly above six statute miles, and most of it will probably be above even 10 statute miles in that region. And the last uh, here would be the wind gusts. Um, we know that there's going to be a lot of windy conditions in this area, so we want to make sure that we don't uh, miss something here. And so in, in this case, we, we do have some stronger winds. In our departure area, we're talking at you know, probably anywhere from maybe 18, 19 knots all the way up to maybe 25 knots right in our departure area. And, uh, and certainly by the later in the afternoon, early evening, a lot more significant wind event here, maybe even up near 30 knots uh, in terms of wind gusts. So, and it might be a little bit uh, windy here. And, and certainly turbulence is another element that uh, um, I like to look at using my uh, let's go ahead and plan, go back to the map. We'll finish up here in just a minute, get some questions. And uh, take a look at the route profile, which provides you a really good depiction of not only icing potential, but also turbulence potential here. So let's take a look at that route profile. And this is the basically the profile of that direct flight. We could make the change to the route and get a little bit different picture. Um, but if I'm going to be departing out of here at 7 a.m., looking at the turbulence aloft, again, this again gives us an indication that we're dealing with values, uh, EDR values, which uh, somewhere around, let's say, uh, 15 or so, we get into the uh, moderate turbulence. So departing out of Mobile here, ending up in Richmond, um, leaving at 7 a.m., this shows us, for the most part, we could probably be in well, it seems like um, light turbulence once we climb through it and staying in light turbulence all the way through until we get to our destination. And that's going over the mountains area. And we can certainly look at, is there any mountain wave turbulence? Right now, there's no mountain wave turbulence predicted um, in that region. But for the, for the most part, it looks like being at 10 or 11 or 12,000 feet would certainly keep us above any of the significant turbulence. So obviously, there may be some turbulence on the climb out. Uh, out of the Mobile area, but uh, the entire route itself looks pretty clean from there. Okay, we'll go ahead and take any questions now. And here's my website, ezwxbrief.com. There is a 14-day trial membership. And if you have any questions, uh, you can send me an email at support at ezwxbrief.com, ezwxbrief.com. And again, there's the Pilot Weather Book URL.